Hey everybody, welcome to the first episode in this new series where we're going to be designing and going over the first production amplifier. Yes, you heard that right. I decided that I want to start doing a very limited production of some of my amplifiers and going to do a YouTube series documenting the thought process and converting what was a do-it-yourself amplifier into something that can be a commercially sold product again in very limited numbers and this isn't something I'm trying to get rich doing I just would like to let other people enjoy the fantastic sound that I've been getting out of some of these amplifiers I've been building and so users can experience for themselves what really good tube amplifiers sound like so the one we're going to be doing as our first production is the 6SQ7 EL34 amp. It's going to be using a pretty decent transformers. We've got a really nice Hammond 290DAX that has, I don't know if you can really see here, but it's got um, shields on the sides of it to protect the output transformers. It's about 20% over in the milliamp rating what this amp actually needs so it runs nice and cool and it's also a lay down style which a lot of the production uh, power transformers are the stand up type and these lower profile lay down time that this was actually made for a fender basement it's a replacement amp uh, replacement power transformer for that and i think it fits good with these lower profile uh, 15 watt ed cores. These are 3.5k ultra linear tapped uh, output transformers. Got a little ham and choke here in the front that's mounted on the top side. To get the voltages where they need to be to make these um, EL34s happy, we're running a kind of a vintage um, 5V4G Coke bottle shaped rectifier tube and Plus, these just really look cool, and they, they light up real nice, and it really makes for a nice-looking amplifier. JJ, just your plain Jane, JJ EL34 output tubes, and these are the magical 6SQ7 driver tubes that are single triode, so you need one for each output tube. And these were originally designed for use, I believe, in an AM radio, they have two small diodes that we're not using that are strapped to the cathode. But I discovered these when I was looking through some tube data sheets and saw these have super linear curves. And when we get into the schematic, I'll show you these tube data sheets and the curves and how to kind of glean from looking at the tubes whether a tube is going to be good for audio or not. So, the production model of this, I'm going to be using this same iron, and I've got some of it already on order. The power transformer should get here fairly quickly, and I don't think I'm having any problem getting the chokes. The output transformer, Ed Core, has a pretty long lead time. Uh, right now they're saying eight weeks. Hopefully it'll be shorter, but I'm not expecting it. And I'm buying enough stuff to have to build two amplifiers. But I am going to have to change a few things for the production model from the one that I built for myself. Uh, one's for kind of safety reasons. And then the other, I may have you all uh, mentioned in the comments which one of these you think I should be doing or not, or I want to make sure that this is something that, you know, mainstream user can just plug in and use, and it's not too oddball. And so some of the things I'm going to change are to make it a little more of a kind of mainstream amplifier. One of the things I'm probably going to do is the, on my own personal amps, I put the inputs on the side, for one reason, I have the amplifier sitting on a little shelf and I have my phono stage sitting on the side of the amp so I can run some really short cables just straight up to the input jacks. 
But the other reason, too, is to keep the inputs away from the power supply as far as possible. But what I'm thinking about doing, because some people put these in a rack or they put them on a, you know, they put them on the top of a shelf where they don't want the cable seen, is to move all these output jacks over just a little bit and put the two input jacks vertically in this corner on the back. And that way people can plug them in kind of like they're used to doing with all the jacks in the back, but still be protected from the noisy AC over here by keeping the input um, shielded cables over here on this far side of the amplifier and around to the front. One of the other things I'm going to be doing is using one of these combination input jacks for the power cord that has a fuse made in it instead of a separate fuse holder. And gonna looks like I'm going to have to mount this vertically on the back, which you know, should be fine. So that's one little change I'm going to have to make. The other thing that I'm going to have to deal with is on the, my, you know, the amp that I use, I don't have a bottom cover on it. And that's not something that I think I can get away with doing, selling it to the public, because obviously the high voltage is inside it. So I'm going to have to put a, a cover over the bottom of it. And this um, choke right here, sits just a little above the surface of this bottom cover and i've got little rubber feet on it so it's not a problem but there's no way i can put a cover on the bottom and not have it just up against this choke which isn't a good idea it kind of warp the bottom and just that's not the way it should be mounted so i'm probably gonna have to move this choke over here along this edge and then there's not going to be room for this big long um angel eye power switch which these are kind of expensive too which you know I, I, I want to make sure that I keep the components that affect the sound of the amplifier but some of these are kind of vanity things that don't really affect um, the you know the quality of the amp and, are, and aren't going to be something I think that would keep someone from buying it so I'm probably going to switch to just a plain a uh, flip rocker switch with an indicator light on it, one of those round ones. Um, I mean, I know they don't look as fancy as this push-on, push-off angel eye one, but, you know, I think that's a sacrifice I'm going to have to make so I can move the choke over here to, to clear room for the switch and to be able to put a bottom plate on the amplifier. I am going to go ahead and put my signature little tube rings on. They're going to add, I think it I comes out to about $50 to so the to the cost of building the amp, but that's including this nice volume knob. So I am going to keep that kind of signature look to it, and of course you'll get the little Skunky Design logo on it. I'm going to also continue my thing of mounting the power resistors for the cathode on the top of the amplifier. I'm going to look at maybe insulating the contacts on the top surface i'm not sure about that though because this is a really handy place to check the cathode voltage which that way users can check the bias when they put different tubes in and make sure they're not running these tubes too hard or that the tubes are worn out and checking the cathode bias will show you that too and so it's not a lot of voltage here that i think there's I think these run like 30 volts on the on the cathode that would be up here external and they're behind the tubes which are really hot I, I got to think about that I don't I don't think that's a real hazard but having live voltage on the top of the amp of a commercial product might be a liability that I don't really want to deal with but I am going to use these really nice quality RCA jacks and speaker jacks that I've been using on all my amps too to, to keep the quality high. One other consideration that I was thinking about, but I think I've changed my mind on this. This amp's really set up to use an EL34 tube. And depending on the speakers that you have, like I use clip speakers, which are a little on the bright side. If someone had some speakers that maybe could use a little more 
brightness out of the amplifier or they wanted to do that to their to tone just for personal taste, you can run some 6CA7 tubes or some KT77s. Any of those will plug into this amp and self-bias with these resistors and the voltages are all great. I think a KT66 would run in this too. But what won't run in it is a KT88. And for one thing, the base of the KT88 won't clear these uh, tube rings. So if I was going to make this amp able to use a KT88, I would have to put larger tube rings and then drill the ventilation holes around it, which I could possibly squeeze those on here. But then I run into the problem of the tubes are really too close together for a KT88. They have specifications on the distance that the tube envelopes should be apart from each other. And I don't think there's room on this size chassis to really put the tubes ideally where they should be spaced from each other. And you could get a little more plate voltage running a 5AR4 instead of this 5V4G. I think it's about 15 volts more maybe 20 volts more on the plate that you could get uh, changing it. But the amp really isn't voiced for using with a KT88. And so if I tried to make it too versatile, where, oh yeah, you can just change this rectifier tube and you can plug KT88s in it. If it isn't really voiced for using those tubes, then I don't feel like that it's the kind of product that I want to put my name on. It's it's a little too watered down, trying to make it a kind of a do-all thing. And I would rather just build a KT-88 amp, which could be a possible future amp that I build is using the same layout on a slightly bigger chassis, but set it up to really drive a KT-88. Because one of the things, and I'll go over this again when we get into the schematic is, I like running the output tubes like almost within a breath of their life. I like running them at like 95% of what the max rating is because I found that the hotter you run the output tubes in an SE amp, the better they sound. And so if I set this up to run KT88s, but they were running kind of lazy, then I don't think it would be a good thing to have my products associated with something that wasn't really an optimum design. So I think I'm going to skip trying to make the amp have allowed that many tubes. The other thing you can do with this though is you can run, a, there's a, another rectifier, but I think it's a 5E4 that drops the voltage even more and then you can put 6V6 tubes in it if somebody wanted to try those out. It's a pretty versatile amp. There's a half dozen at least different types of output tubes that can be put into this thing. And so I think we'll just stop there and call it good. So anyway, just an update on where this is going. i am got the parts ordered, the chassis, and the some of the iron should be here soon. And since I know where the output transformers are going to go, and I know where to drill the holes, I think I can go ahead and start building the rest of the amplifier and then when the output transformers get here, do the final assembly. So we may, get, we may be starting to build on this within the next week or so. So I'm really excited about this product and this process. And again, I'm probably only going to build a couple of them and really get an idea of like what all the parts cost and how much time this is going to take and then what they could sell for. And that's something else you could make in the comments is what would you be willing to pay for a hand-built, really beautiful sounding EL34 amp? I mean, I know it's not a 300B, but the tubes are cheap, the it's easy to maintain, and... I've been perfectly happy listening to this amp with my turntable and my ER834 photo stage for over a year with my little Clips RP600M speakers. And 
I think for a kind of mid-level system, this one really checks all the boxes. So anyway, hopefully you'll be keep following this video series. And if you like my channel, please subscribe, like the video, and we'll be back soon to get cracking on this 6SQ7 amplifier. Thanks for watching.